All right. Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you joining us here today. We're going to have a great talk with uh, the FAA CISO. So let me start by welcoming Larry Grossman to DEF CON in the Aerospace Village. Appreciate having you here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Steve. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. And we appreciate your time. So uh, for everybody, uh, we're going to dig into the government side of things, particularly with the Federal Aviation Administration, talking with uh, Larry about what the FAA's role is, where cybersecurity is a part of that, his role in supporting that overall mission, and then his thoughts on uh, the security research work and the things that he deals with. So uh, before we get rolling, though, let me, uh, I will introduce myself also. I'm Steve Luzinski. I'm the chairman of the nonprofit board that we have that's running the Aerospace Village and helping support these activities. Uh, so, again, appreciate you all being here and joining us today. For those of you who don't know, Larry Grossman, he is the Federal Aviation Administration's Director of the Office of Information Security and Privacy and the Chief Information Security Officer. In these roles, he provides strategic leadership of FAA's information security and privacy programs. And this isn't the only role he's been in at the FAA. He's been with FAA for 25 years. Uh, and I think even more telling is being with the agency that long and as an aviation enthusiast, uh, an avid enthusiast at that. He's a commercial pilot, flight instructor certificates, both air, or I'm sorry, both land and sea. And he travels in his own aircraft whenever he can. So I'm very jealous of that. So again, I appreciate you being here today, Larry, uh, hearing about your background in both cybersecurity and the aviation side of things and joining us for this discussion. So with that, I want to jump into, uh, if you would, uh, I think, you know, we all think we know what the FAA does. We think we know or we have a general idea, but not necessarily the details. So I'd be interested in is getting your perspective on the FAA's mission and particularly uh, in the cybersecurity side of things. Sure, sure. Um, happy. And I'm, so I'm, uh, I, I am the... Uh... The official um, uh, chief information security officer, but uh, only for the last month. I, I was acting chief information security officer for the last two and a half years. So they finally, um, you know, uh, made made a made a uh, an honest man out of me. But um, so you know, the the FAA's uh, mission is is very simple. It, there's basically two pieces to it: uh, safety and efficiency. Those, that's, that's the mission. The mission of the FAA is to safely move aircraft through the national airspace system um, and, and, uh, and to assure that they move as efficiently as possible. Um, so from a, from a cybersecurity perspective, you know, there's, there's certainly uh, uh, countless areas that we have to be concerned about. Um, the FAA has, um, you know, roughly uh, 360 FISMA reportable systems. That FISMA is Federal Information System Security Act. Um, it, it was put in place several years ago. It, 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 allow, it requires us to inventory all of our systems to, to, to perform compliance activities on all those systems. So we have a, a pretty big inventory. Um, you know, for a moderate size a government agency, um, you know, we have a, a fairly large number of, of systems. Within those systems, we have probably 2,500 or so applications that run. So, you know, so it's a, it's a fairly large inventory, uh, certainly a, a large, um, you know, uh, attack surface, so to speak, um, you know, and, and to, to keep all those systems secure. You know, historically, FAA has focused inward on those systems, and we've, we've looked at the FAA, you know, just on how we secure our systems and how we secure our services. Um, but the, you know, the aviation ecosystem is much larger than the FAA specifically, right? There's the, and, and the FAA only has, you know, a small piece of it. You know, we, we do operate, uh, the national airspace system, you know, it's critical infrastructure in the United States. Um, and, uh, we move, you know, hundreds of thousands of airplanes a day. Uh, we're back, you know, now that we're, we're hopefully on the, on the backside of COVID, uh, we're back to roughly 90 something percent of pre-COVID numbers. So, uh, so people are traveling, uh, airplanes are moving and they're moving safely. Um, you know, the, the, um, 
Um, the the efficiency piece really is is really where where we get kind of wrapped around the axle at times. You know, how do we keep planes moving efficiently? Um, and we do that through a number of systems that we have to keep secure. And those systems are, you know, working with airlines, working with other partners um, and uh, aircraft manufacturers, et cetera. So there's a kind of a lot of pieces that all work together. Absolutely. No doubt. There's a lot to deal with in that sense. Um, one of the things that comes to mind when I think about the FAA is the regulatory side of things. And that's the hammer that comes down that has to impose a fine and punishment. But I know uh, from previous work that we've done with you all, including last year, uh, I, last year uh, online with, with a virtual DEF CON where we had uh, folks from your engagement office who are externally focused. How do you balance the the hammer regulator side of things that has to impose uh, you know, when when a problem happens, but also the need to engage, the need to get folks to understand vulnerability disclosure and addressing these problems? Uh, how do you deal with all of that? Well, you know, and as a as a commercial pilot who who made his living for a little while uh, as a commercial pilot, I, I I did my best to avoid that hammer as well. So. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, the the um, 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 the the talk that we had last year you know, at, at the village um, with our ACI partners, you know, that's kind of one of the areas that we've just fairly recently moved into. And that is, as I said earlier, we've always focused inward, uh, but realizing that the ecosystem is much larger and what pieces of of that ecosystem does FAA own and operate? Uh, what pieces do we regulate? Uh, and what pieces do we really have have either a shared engage, involvement with, um, like uh, like with respect to airlines and, and airports, um, and and some that we have just no involvement at all. Um, so we formed a team um, that was working with DHS and DoD. Um, the, the team became the the Aviation Cyber Initiative, um, and uh, and their focus really is to is f- around outreach and and. Um, you know, around understanding how, you know, as example, airlines are securing their system or, or how aircraft manufacturers are, are building in, you know, various components. While we do certify the components of the aircraft, we do test the components of the aircraft. There are many pieces, parts and pieces to that, that, you know, that, that the airlines, I mean, that the aircraft manufacturers do on their own. Um, airports is another area that, you know, that FAA um, has a really kind of a very interesting relationship with, um, you know, within the United States, there's over 17,000 public use airports um, and they go every, they, you know, kind of run everywhere from a grass strip, you know, in a field somewhere to Chicago O'Hare, you know, in Atlanta Hearts Field uh, and in kind of everything in between. And, you know, we like to say that there's, there's 17,000 airports in the U.S. and there's 17,000 different airports because each one of those airports is managed a little different, is operated a little differently. Some are operated by airport authorities. Some are up, operated by municipalities. Um, and, um, you know, some are private, actually privately owned, but, but are allowed to be public use. Um, and, and so how do we, you know, how do we work with those airlines across the board? Um, you know, so the answer, the answer is around, around outreach, around better understanding how they, um, you know, how they're implementing cybersecurity. Uh, and how we can kind of help them with respect to standards and, and, you know, kind of drive better practices, better cyber hygiene, because it's really most of it's about around cyber hygiene. Absolutely. So thank you. That's the, you know, when we have talked about and heard others talk about the complexity of the aviation and aerospace uh, ecosystem, hearing 17,000 uh, really hammers home that point. So that's that's not something I knew before, so it's good to learn. Um, one thing I, I didn't, uh, you know, understanding the FAA's overall mission, but also understanding what is your part of that. And I didn't mention it before or ask you, but I'm interested in hearing what was your path? What motivated you to uh, do both AVID pilot and joining the FAA? They seem to go together very well, but certainly some cybersecurity thrown in there on top of it. They they do yeah it's an, you know we all everyone has their their interesting paths to where they get places um, 
So I went to school for aviation. Um, uh, I was a, a pilot by, you know, um, by training, and I, I, I did make it into the military. I, I wore glasses, so that was the discriminator for me. Um, so, you know, I, I started working as a pilot um, um, back in the, I guess, the late 80s-ish, um, and, uh, and really realized that um, the path I was taking, you know, the late 80s, there, there was, you know, at, everything's about timing, right? Life is about timing. And, and the timing where when I was trying to get hired by, you know, regional aircraft, I was actually flying, um, uh, flying checks for a while, flying small cargo for a while, you know, flying, you know, uh, you take off at, you know, one o'clock in the morning and, you know, lay in rain and snow and, and, and land at four o'clock in the morning. And, and, and so it was really not a lot of fun. It, it was fun at first, but, you know, after six months of that, it started to be not a lot of fun. Um, in a little airplane by yourself, you know, you're kind of flying along and, um, um, you know, and, and so I, I had, um, you know, an aviation major and a computer science minor. Um, and, and I found myself, um, uh, getting hired, um, actually initially part time by a consulting company for the FAA here where I live in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, the, the, the FAA has a, uh, a second level support facility here where we support, um, um, you know, all of the air traffic control s- systems that are deployed, um, here. And so I started working on air traffic control systems kind of part time and flying full time. And then the, it kind of evolved to flying, you know, not quite so full time and working more full time and, and kind of slid myself over into working on air traffic control systems. Um, you know, as a programmer and then moving up as a designer, developer, then moving up as a, a manager of, of the, the air traffic control systems. Um, and then, um, and then 9-11 hit. And, um, you know, and, and like in October of 2001, um, uh, my boss at the time said, you know, we, we need, what do you know about cybersecurity? I said, I know enough not to get myself in trouble. That's about it. He said, well, I'm going to get you some training. And we need to figure out how we're going to start securing the the air traffic control s- systems. We're going to we we don't understand a lot of how we're managing our air traffic control systems. We need more. We need more of our kind of administrative functions off of the air traffic control side. And so I deployed a bunch of programs that, that kind of improved our ability to to monitor the the, the operational side uh, to move a lot of those kind of uh, administrative functions off of the operations and into our mission support environment, you know, and, and kind of one thing led to another. And, and, and so I, I worked my way around for a while. Um, you know, I, I, I worked uh, in cyber for about seven years and then I got, got out of cyber for a little bit and did some work for the FAA administrator around, uh, around data distribution and around improving the way FAA um uh, gives data out. The FAA gives tons and tons and tons of data out. We're one of the largest data distribution. You know, we just spew data out. If, you, if anyone ever uses, um, you know, FlightAware or, or, or any of those applications, the FAA outputs, you know, almost a, a terabyte a day of data. So there's a there's a just a ton of data that that we give out. But we were at the time we really weren't giving it out in a way that would spur innovation, that would drive innovation. And our FAA administrator at the time. Said, you know, there, you know, if we improve the way we're we're releasing data, we will spur innovation. They'll build better products for pilots to use, and it will improve safety. And and we'll move, you know. And so so we did that. So I took kind of a break, and then I came back into cyber again. I missed it, so I came back to the cyber. <laughs> and so um, and so here here I am. And and in no small role because you're dealing with not only the internal FAA systems. Uh, but from what we talked about before, you're running the gamut of things that you have to deal with. What are some, what is the scope and scale of your responsibilities? Cause I know well, it's, it's extensive. Yeah. We, I mean, we have a lot going on. Um, we have, certainly we have our, our security operations, you know, um, um, organization and, and we run, uh, we run our own SOC. We, we, um, we're, we're, you know, always moving to improve our SOC capabilities. Um, we uh, we have a, a pretty big compliance shop. Compliance is uh, as I, I mentioned before uh, a FISMA requirement, and we 
we look at every system um, and service, um, you know, in, in the FAA and make sure that, you know, look at the at the NIST controls to make sure that their controls are implemented appropriately. That's a huge effort with the number of systems we have. We have a governance shop that um, that um, um, you know writes our policy. We have a we have a pretty big policy, you know, for security and privacy. Um, the policy, you know, at it has grown because we've we've incorporated all of the NIST controls into our policy and and how we're going to implement those controls. And and so um, so that's a kind of a big effort. We do training. We we have our security awareness and 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 role based training that we. We conduct. Um, I run our privacy office. Um, we, you know, with all, all of the, um, the the privacy documentation that's required, as well as any breach that may occur, um, we we respond to that. Of course, SIDS organization that's our our externally facing um, organization, and and all the work we're doing around, um, you know, um, CDM, the continuous diagnostics and mitigation um, uh, effort, um, the new executive order. Um, that that's out, um, you know, our work with um, with uh, with a lot of our, our partners. I work closely with um, with other agencies um, and and departments. We have a, 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 big, a lot of big efforts with DOD, you know, FAA and DOD share uh, a lot of commonality with respect to um, um, moving aircraft and, and, and et cetera. Um, um, and um, and that's it. You know, just that, just a couple of things here and there. Yeah. So you mentioned before Sid's group and Sid was with us last year and it was great to hear him talk about that engagement and outreach. And that's with our audience in particular. So that's an area I wanted to dig into is uh, the efforts that you all are making to connect with the security researcher community. And so I'm interested in your thoughts of what's driving that and what is y'all's approach to Im- improve those in- type of engagements. Yeah, so well, we're always looking to to uh, improve our engagements with the research community. We're we're actually we're doing it on our own with several initiatives that that um, that Sid is leading. We we have um, a lot of engagements. We're engaged with the Aviation ISAC very closely, um, you know, around, around which is kind of focused on aviation, um, but also through mandate by DHS through uh, through um, uh, a directive. Um, 2001 that that really requires us to um, to run an ex you know a disclosure program that where we we invite researchers to um, to look for vulnerabilities and look for them in a in a positive uh, manner and report them to us and and so we have a, a pretty big effort right now ongoing we're we we started with with one um, you know externally facing site now I think we're at four or five externally facing sites over the course of the the next i think i think 12 or 18 months uh, i can't remember exactly which all of the externally facing sites that the fa has and there's there are quite a few um will be open for researchers to look for vulnerabilities and we're certainly we're certainly um uh, looking forward to that engagement we've you know it was funny the the first week we had one uh website up I think it went live on a Friday and by Monday we had like five reports, you know, and, nice. uh, and there were five different reports and, you know, and some of them were, were not valid, but some of them were, you know, Hey, we found cross site scripting here. We found, you know, um, um, you know, I, I forget what the other one was, but you know, there, there are, are um, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, crowdsourcing, looking for vulnerabilities um, in a, in a, collaborative and productive way is very important to us and and we know we can't find all the all the bugs and all the vulnerabilities so we certainly look forward to uh to folks helping us and and the folks that are listening here absolutely so two things came to mind i know there's we're recording this ahead of time and there's going to be a live question and answer uh where we'll both be on there while this is being recorded i'm sure folks are going to ask what is that website address. What are all the website addresses? Sorry, I can't so that's tell something. You. Sorry, I can't. No, okay, no. <laughs> the public I'll, ones. So I'll I will get those from you when we get done recording, and I'll have it ready because I know that's going to come up, and that's great because we want to get that out there and share that. We've done that before with SISA and their program. 
Uh, and the other part of the work that you're talking about, uh, all the way back to DEF CON 27, when we, the Aviation Village, that was the first time we were there. And I know you were part of the behind the scenes with the CAN bus disclosure that was coordinated through CISA and Rapid7 uh, and Patrick Kiley's search, uh, research that led to rolling that out at the time. So we're very appreciative of that continued the cooperation and somebody like you that has definitely seen behind the behind the scenes what goes into all of it to making that happen. And I think experience with other uh, types of disclosures in the public, whether or not they were coordinated or were just disclosed. So uh, definitely good to see that experience. Absolutely. Uh, that you've got share from there. We uh, that was my first, really my first, um, uh, the first work I we did with Rapid Seven, and we've we've done, had other engagements with them as well. So it was a it was a great engagement. Yeah, you bet. How about on the workforce side? Uh, I think the you know, the typical thing that you hear is we can't find the right people, we can't get the right skills. You're competing with others, especially as a government agency. What what are your thoughts on? Are you seeing the same problems or is FAA doing something different to engage and attract folks with those skills? Well, you know, you know what I like to say, the um, the the unemployment rate for cybersecurity professionals is is in the negative numbers. Right. There's certainly not enough uh, cyber folks to go around. So um, we do uh, compete for the cybersecurity workforce. Um, we and we do it pretty successfully, too, I, I might add. I think, you know, um we're, we are a government agency, we, but we do have, um, you know, flexibilities for hiring that, that have been offered to us through, um, through OPM, Office of Personal mm-hmm. Management. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have a great mission. We, I think the mission of the FAA is what, you know, is really what attracts folks to us. And we, we have had folks come from, um, you know, from from so a lot of our of our vendor community, our, our contractor uh, workforce have moved over. Um, they, you know, some of them have even taken a pay cut to move over. Not not a lot. I mean, we're, we could be pretty competitive salary wise, um, but we're we're certainly um, can be competitive. And they they just love the mission. Our you know, there's nothing cooler than moving airplanes and and being involved in a system that is as critical to the, the U.S. and the global economy. We work internationally extensively, um, and uh, you know, down to the technical level of work that we're able to do, and the you know, um, the 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 high demand that we have for for workforce. So I, you know, I think we're we're doing pretty well. You know, we're, we're we do better better than a lot of of my peer uh, CISOs that we talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, in in addition the the recent legislation, I should add, um, required uh, actually 2018, the FAA, the 2018 Reauthorization Act that gave FAA its its authority to to run. We're we're a piece of the Department of Transportation, but we operate under our own authority. Um, and one of the um, uh, one of the items on there was that we conduct a uh, we we engage with the National Academy of Science. Um, to conduct a, a, a study of the cybersecurity workforce on how to uh, attract and retain, um, you know, that cybersecurity workforce that we need. Because right. I think the, I think Congress recognized that, um, you know, it's such a critical function. The FAA is so critical to to our economy and to to safety of, of you know, of everyone that, um, um, that that they asked us to do this. And, you know, the report was just released. And so, I'll, I will also have the the web address of that. Um, and I'll provide that to you too, uh, that folks can go read that. And um, you know, it, it made. It, it, I think we got 18 recommendations around um, around workforce, around um, um, you know, moving forward. And 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 most of them were pretty positive. I mean, I, I believe that we have a, a a really good workforce, but it's certainly a workforce that is. Um, um, you know, it's 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 an experienced workforce, and it's you know a lot of folks transition. You know, cyber the cyber landscape is changing so rapidly now; um, it's almost logarithmic changes. And you know what what we would love to have um, are you know those those next generation of cyber professionals 
that that want a really cool mission that want to come and make a difference in you know um you know in the united states in in our security in the critical infrastructure of the united states you know the faa is the only department um within the government that operates a piece of the critical infrastructure the the kind of technologies that we're deploying now um are are would really be exciting i think for for uh, for folks that want to get engaged yeah you bet so it sounds like there's no doubt you all are hiring oh no doubt there you go. Bring it on. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So my last question before we wrap things up here, what is your biggest concern? What keeps you up at night as the FAA CISO looking at internal issues, external issues across the breadth and all of that complex ecosystem that we talked about? Well, um, Steve, you were you were CISO um, fairly recently. You know, if you if you got any sleep when you were a CISO, you're not doing your job, right? We you give up as part of the job requirements. You don't sleep. No, I I think you know um, we we do. There's a lot of things that that um, you know, and I mentioned I mentioned some of them. I mentioned the you know certainly the sophistication of the adversary that we're facing um, has really changed. You know, Solar Winds kind of showed that, right? Solar with the Solar Winds compromise. Showed us all that that these folks um, are, you know, um, a state sponsored, highly sophisticated, highly motivated, um, can live off the land very easily, uh, go undetected. You know, when you say, well, what are the IOCs? Well, there are no IOCs, right? There's no there, is, you know, but but you but you have compromise. And and so, um, you know, that that certainly is uh, is worrisome to us. Um the um, the uh, the fact that we 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 went um, almost overnight from uh, from average of about four thousand um, employees of forty five thousand teleworking to thirty five thousand um, teleworking you know mm-hmm. you know it's kind of a snap of a finger um, and it required us to to make some pretty significant changes in how we monitor and secure endpoints. Um, you know, how we monitor and secure our systems, um, you know, and, you know, we we give all of our employees a, a workstation, a, a government issued workstation. They they put it on their kitchen table. They work from, you know, nine to five. And then, you know, it's six thirty, seven o'clock. They're like, well, here's a computer sitting here. I, I got to go order some stuff off of, uh, you know, Target online or I've got to go. I want to go watch a movie or I want to go. So we've really had to lock down the workstations. We've locked down um, the the um, the services that folks can run, you know, and it's that it's that balance of of securing the the um, you know our our equipment, our systems, our services, and user convenience and you know user performance. And and I think the last thing that keeps me up at night, um, well, the last the, the last of the top three <laughs> that keep me up at night. Um, are, you know, the FAA used to own the entire airspace. We used to own all the systems and all the services. And really, we're moving more to uh, getting a lot of services now. Mm-hmm. So it's really not a factor of us securing our systems and services. It's also securing the systems and services that we acquire from right. our partners. Uh, and, ha- and, and how do they secure their systems and services? And then how do those folks secure? So it's kind of a long road. Um, and, you know, and that's kind of where SID's ecosystem work comes in. Um, you know, it, it, it's where the work that we do with the other lines of business and staff offices within the FAA. So so those are, the, I guess, the top three. Just just the top three, which is plenty enough. Uh, and I know there's lots more. So, well, Larry, I really appreciate the time. Uh, I have no doubt our audience, uh, you know, lots of questions coming in, I'm sure, as we've been talking here and plenty more. So thank you for uh, that's great insight. Things that, again, I thought I had some familiarity with the FAA, but learning uh, the full scope and scale of what you all are doing, what you personally are doing. And again, taking time out to share that with our audience. Uh, we're very appreciative of that. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you to everybody who joined us today. And we look forward, if you're on site, to uh, talking with us in the village. Otherwise, uh, keep an eye out on our website for future events from the Aerospace Village. So thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot for having me, Steve. You bet.